Hello, and welcome to our online worship here at Shiloh United Methodist Church on this Christ the King Sunday. We're happy that you've chosen to worship with us today. I'm Jerry Suit, the traditional worship coordinator here at Shiloh. Uh, we hope that you're blessed in this time together. And now let us invite the Lord to be with us in this time of worship. Ruler of all nations, we enter into your house humbled by this world's powers, and we feel defeated. So we lay all our burdens at your altar. We pray that today we hear afresh your words of love and grace. Most importantly, we seek your direction. God bless us and speak to us again. Amen.
there and welcome to the worship broadcast for Shiloh United Methodist Church. I'm so glad that you've tuned in. My name is Kirk Tomlinson and I get to be the pastor around here at the church and I'm just so glad that you've tuned in with us today. We are, if you've been tuning in, if you're a regular attender of our online broadcast, you'll know we're in the last week of our sermon series uh, which we're looking at our mission statement. It's, it's helping us rediscover our purpose both as individuals uh, and as a church. But if this is your first time wandering into our broadcast, you may uh, think that it's a little church-focused, and particularly at the end, we're going to get really church-focused. Uh, so come back next week, and we'll be uh, looking at uh, the Advent series of, of Jesus coming to earth and uh, becoming one of us with the theology of the incarnation. That's a big church word, uh, but we're going to start talking about that next week. I still think you're going to get something out of this sermon, even if you're not a part of Shiloh. But if you are a part of Shiloh, this is really the culmination of what we've been talking about for the last three weeks. It's, it's, it's really flown by, and um, what we're talking about is our mission statement with its three parts to glorify God, uh, to develop disciples of Jesus Christ and to change the world. Uh, we looked at the first week, glorifying God. We discovered that we do that in two main ways. First, by putting Jesus at the center of everything we do, both individually and as a church. And we try to move ourselves out of the center. Uh, that Cain syndrome from Genesis 4, I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, a little bit later, and put Jesus in the center of our lives. And we do that by worshiping in reverence and awe. I've come to love those two words. Reverence, respect for God, awe. God, you're amazing. And though, then we moved on to the second part of our mission statement, which was to develop disciples of Jesus Christ. And in that, we recognized that Jesus was the master in how he developed his disciples. So we learn from him. First, he taught them the ways of heaven. We need to study and we need to learn the ways of heaven. Those, those lessons that Jesus taught his disciples are written down in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're surrounded by other parts of scripture, Old Testament, the rest of the New Testament, that just fill us up and teach us about who God is and the ways of heaven. But then Jesus takes it the next step and says we need to be putting what we learn into action. We need to be willing to sacrifice on behalf of the kingdom of God. And if we glorify God and if we develop disciples, we can't help but change the world. But what does it mean to change the world? I mean, Einstein changed the world when he came up with the theory of relativity. Um, Thomas Edison changed the world when he came up with the light bulb. Bill France changed the world when he came up with NASCAR. <laughs> Maybe that one's not as important as the other two, but, 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 but you, get my, you get my meaning. And, and while these are world-changing inventions, they're really small potatoes compared to how God can change the world. And I'm not just talking about God's ability to create out of just words. You read that story in Genesis and you realize that God created all of creation using just words. No, I'm talking about changing us. And by changing us, it changes the world. Those of us who at our core are human beings and we're affected by that Cain syndrome. That story is from Genesis 4. And if you remember that story, Cain gets so jealous and envious and angry at his brother uh, that he kills him. And it's that, that jealousy and that anger and that frustration and that judgment that, that still rests in the human spirit. It leads to enmity and strife and jealousy and anger and envy. And uh, that leads to impurity and strife and quarrels with one another. And the reality is we all have these tendencies and they're so universal that when Paul writes his book to his letter to the Galatians, becomes our book of Galatians, he lists them. Along with the ones I would just shared with you, if you were wondering where I pulled enmity out of, um, he lists these. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, sorcery, dissensions, factions, drunkenness, carousing, and he ends the list with, these were his words, things like these. Whew. It's quite a list. 16 elements at all. If you want to look at them, uh, go to Galatians 5 yourself and you can read through them. 
These are things that left up to our own ends is what all of us humans will do. Well, I've been been identifying these as symptoms of the Cain syndrome. Paul uses a a different description, a different title um, to uh, put over this entire list of 16. He calls it the desires of the flesh. And he opposes it to the desires of the spirit. The desires of the flesh are these human tendencies, this Cain syndrome that puts us at the center and, and makes us do all of these things. It's what we're naturally inclined to. And it's obvious, he said. Then he lists them. He says, these are really obvious. And then he lists them for us, this, this group of 16. And then he gives us the formula on how to change ourselves and in changing ourselves change the world. Check this out. This is Galatians 5 verses 16 and 17. He said, live by the spirit, I say, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. For what the flesh desires is, watch this, opposed to the spirit. Brings us back to that spirit part of our mission statement that we looked at earlier, right? And what the spirit desires is opposed to the flesh, for these are opposed to each other to, watch this, prevent you from doing what you want. See that last part? I want to say it again just so it sinks in. To prevent you from doing what you want. Here's where we go a little deep. Paul is saying that you really don't want to do this list of 16 things, these desires of the flesh that are so obvious, but he listed them anyway. These 16 things, he says, drag us down into places that work on our souls and make us feel worse and worse and worse and worse. I could keep going about ourselves. Left or on our own, friends, the, the, the truth is we don't know how to break out of this cycle of gratifying the desires of the flesh. And left to those desires, we will never get where we really want to go, Paul says. We want to have a life with meaning and purpose and grace and peace. And we can only get there by living according to the Spirit. And the first two steps of our mission statement help us understand how to live according to the Spirit. Glorifying God, putting Jesus at the center of our lives, worshiping with reverence and awe, and Developing disciples of Jesus Christ, first in ourselves by studying and acting on what we learn about, and then doing that for others. The result is another list. Paul calls this list the fruit of the Spirit. Now, notice it's fruit. See, here's where we get this wrong sometimes. If you remember in week one, if you've been tuning in for the last couple of weeks, we talked about how we get um, bearing your cross wrong all of the time. It's not the hardships that are thrust upon us. We've talked about this several times. Those are hard and you need your faith to get through them. But what it means to take up your cross and follow Jesus is to those things that we sacrifice on behalf of Jesus to be able to follow Jesus. We do the same thing here with the fruit of the Spirit. See, we have wrongly begun to think about this list as a list of virtues that we need to live up to, that we need to strive to have. But that's not how fruit works, friends. You know this. You know where fruit comes from. To get good fruit, you need a strong plant, a strong tree, a strong whatever fruit grows on. You get good, strong plants and trees and, 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 and bushes and all of those things because you plant them in good soil and you feed them good food and, and you water them and they get good light and they get good sun. You get the fruit of the Spirit by being a good, strong disciple of Jesus Christ by glorifying God, by developing disciples. This isn't a list to try to live up to. Watch this. It's the reward. We get to live a life full of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It's a list of nine. And Paul says this is our reward. This is our fruit. So this shift from living for uh, for what the flesh desires to living for what the spirit desires is nothing less than life-changing and it's nothing less than world-changing. 
Which brings us back to where we started this whole journey together. If you want to change the world, live according to the Spirit. And how do we live according to the Spirit? We glorify God and develop discipleship. And if we glorify God and develop discipleship and we're living by the Spirit, we get to, the, we, as a benefit, we get the fruit of the Spirit, that list of... See how it goes around and around and around and around? How much better, friends? How much better would our world be if we all lived in love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and... Self-control. No, I didn't lose my place in my notes. I stopped for a moment to let that question sink in. I'll ask it again. How much better would it be if for everyone, if we could just live out this list of nine rather than the list of 16 that Paul delineates earlier, the obvious list of 16? So how do we get there? By introducing ourselves and others to living by the Spirit and inviting us to set aside the list of 16 by listening to the Spirit instead of our own flesh. And the result is we get to live a life of of nine amazing fruits of the Spirit that are so much better and healthier and more fulfilling for all of us. Letting God be in charge rather than keeping ourselves at the center. And we do that again by glorifying God. Putting Jesus at the center, worshiping with reverence and awe. I know it sounds like I'm being repetitious, but I want you to see how this all works together because it does. And that's who we are. That's what we're all about. And it's the spirit that binds it all together and leads us into the future. But there's one attitude, friends, and this is where I want to transition uh, into our stewardship time. There's one attitude that that, that unlocks the whole thing, and that's the attitude of generosity. Now, when I say the word generosity, especially when I link it up with stewardship, most of you are going to start thinking about money, and this is where the pastor starts asking about money. But hold on a second, because I want you to hear this. Uh, Now, if you're a regular part of the church, yeah, we're going to eventually talk about money, but it's so much more than that. And and whether you're a regular part of the church or not, this is going to be relevant. This is going to strengthen you. Uh, What the attitude of generosity does is it fights against the attitude of scarcity. And while money is one of those pieces, an attitude of scarcity when it comes to money can also infect the rest of our lives. We can either catch scarcity in our whole lives or we can catch generosity in our whole lives. A culture of generosity believes that God will provide all that we can imagine and more. And not just financially. All the people we need, all the energy we need, all the wisdom we need, all the talent we need, all the love we need, all the grace we need. Remember that list of nine? All of those things in abundance and even, yes, friends, all the money we need. Contrast that to the culture of scarcity. Now, a culture of scarcity tells you that you have to conserve what you have because you will never, ever have enough. And even if you're blessed in a certain area, you have to conserve what you've been blessed with because someday, whether it's tomorrow or next week or next year or 10 years from now, you're going to run out. And so we conserve our praise. We become critical and suspicious. We conserve our prayer and we get farther away from God. We conserve our spirit and we turn more and more inward. We conserve our welcome and we become cold and, and, and unwelcoming. We conserve our willingness to serve and we have fewer and fewer volunteers. And yes, we even conserve our money and it hampers our ability to praise God, to develop disciples of Jesus Christ. And it really hampers our ability to change the world. Generosity. We need to unlock it in our lives and we need, to, we need to find a way to unlock it in our church because we need to change the world. So how do we do that? Well, we turn, as we often do, to the teachings of Jesus. And in doing so, we find a story about generosity that we may not have thought was about generosity. It's called the parable of the workers in the vineyard. Now, first thing to know is that it's a parable. 
And to remind you, when Jesus talks in parables, these are fictional stories meant to make a point, but they're a little hyperbolic. They're a little bit larger than life. For instance, in this story, this isn't about business practices. If you were to run your business about the story I'm about to share with you, you'd go out of business just like that. This isn't a story about running a business. This is a story about generosity. So here's what happens. There's a guy that needs people to work in his workers uh, to work in his vineyard. So he goes out first thing in the morning and he loads a bunch of guys up and he brings them out to the vineyard. And what he does is he agrees to pay them a, a denarius, which in our world would be about 50 bucks, about minimum wage for the day. And then what he does is he needs more workers. So he goes out four more times at nine o'clock, at 12 o'clock, at three o'clock and about five o'clock. And he gets more people and he says to them, he doesn't promise them a loan. He promises to pay them fairly. And here's where it gets interesting. At the end of the day, he starts with those five o'clock people, those last people hired. And, and he brings them in and gives each of them a denarius. He does the same thing with the three o'clock people. Same thing with the 12 o'clock people. Same thing with the nine o'clock people. And it's these early morning folks that are going, yeah, buddy. They, I worked the whole day. They didn't work the whole day. And so if they got a denarius, man, we are in for it. We are, we are about to be rolling in it. And he brings those people in and they received a denarius, which is what they had been promised. And they grumbled. They actually went to the landowner and said to him, this isn't fair. We worked all day and we got the same thing they got. This isn't right. This isn't fair. To which the landowner said to them, fair's where pigs get ribbons. <laughs> I want you to think about that for a second. You're going to laugh later. Trust me. Actually, he says this. This is verse 15. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? And, and here's the line. Or are you envious because I am generous? Now, this story really isn't about money. Here Jesus is talking about God's grace. How we receive the same reward from God, whether we come to faith as a child or we come to faith on our deathbed. We all receive the same amount of grace from God. That's what the kingdom of heaven is like. But just like all of Jesus' teachings, there can be more than one lesson. And what Jesus reveals here when he talks about the reaction of the early morning workers shows us the chief barrier to generosity. And it's not whether or not you have the means to be generous. You can have everything you need to be generous and still be stingy. On the other hand, you can have very little and still be generous. No, Jesus talks about what sinks generosity is what? expectation, entitlement, selfishness, this notion of fairness. I worked much harder and I got the same amount of pay. That's not fair. Listen carefully to what Jesus says through the words of the landowner. You are envious, you are jealous, you are angry, you are like king because you expected more. But you were never promised more. Had the others not shown up, had the others not gotten paid that same wage, you would, have, you would have left today, you would have been perfectly happy, perfectly satisfied with what you got. But because of your expectations, friends, advertisers count on this. Stirring up our dissatisfaction because someone else has something better. It's what drives our consumer economy. It's what drives politics these days. It can even creep into our families, and when it does, it destroys them. This story is best understood when we realize that it comes right after um, an encounter with a young man that asked Jesus a deep theological question. What is it that I must do to be able to get into heaven? His first response, Jesus' first response is, is, is simple. Follow the rules, follow the commandments. And the young man, kind of like those early morning workers, yeah, I do all that, I'm all set. And so, so he says that and Jesus says, great. But there's expectations of something more. He says to Jesus, yeah, but what else should I do? 
Now, had he not had that expectation, had he not gone that, that next step, had he not gone beyond, if he didn't take yes for an answer. Had he taken yes for an answer, Jesus would have never had this next, uh, this next statement. But he says, what else do I have to do? Jesus said, this is Mark 19, or excuse me, Matthew 19, 21. Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, notice the caveat, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Be generous. And it tells us in the text that the man went away sad because he had a lot of money. Of money, excuse me. You see, expectation. The young man wasn't satisfied with the first answer, so he challenged Jesus for the second answer, and it was too much for him. He expected Jesus to tell him, great, you followed the commandments, you're, you're perfectly fine, just like everybody else. Instead, he challenged Jesus to have a transformed life, to go to the next level, and Jesus said you had to be generous. Had to, and this young man had everything he needed to be generous. He had lots of resources, but he couldn't bring himself to be generous to the level that Jesus wanted him to be. So he went away sad. Let me talk to the church folk. There are hundreds, thousands, millions of churches that operate out of a culture of scarcity. There's never enough. And they're just as sad all the time as this young man was after he left Jesus. And they struggle to connect people with God. But generosity pushes us to always be on the lookout for the next way to glorify, develop, and change the world rather than worrying about what we should get. Being generous keeps the main focus on the main focus, on being grateful for what we have received rather than angry about what someone else has gotten. The words of the Landover echo in our minds. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my money? Or are you envious because I am generous. When we are acting on behalf of God in the world by being generous, there are plenty of people who are going to come after us, like the early morning workers, people who are envious because of our generosity. But friends, Jesus is telling us here, and I want to echo his words, generosity is what changes the world. So how do we be generous? Well, this morning, or this afternoon, or this evening, whenever you're tuning in, I want to use church tradition to do that. If you're a, a regular part of the church, you would have gotten this in the mail this week. Um, it's our 2025 estimate of giving card. And, and what it asks us to do is to think about our generosity, not just in terms of money, but in terms of all of the membership promises we have here in the church. A little theology around membership. We believe deeply in the United Methodist Church about baptism, but baptism is our, our way in to, to, to connect with the universal church. It is God who acts on us to forgive us, to love us, and to bring us into God's family. When we join the church, it is an extension of that baptism. We have to be baptized first. Don't have to be baptized to go to heaven in our theology, but you do have to baptize, be baptized in order to join the church. And then once you join the church, that's your public proclamation of, uh, of faith. And you stand up and you make five vows, five promises um, that are consistent with our theology of baptism. We promise to serve the church through our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. That's the key to unlocking generosity is looking at all five of those areas and being generous in all of them. So if you've got this card, here's what we're asking you to do. If you're not, think about this anyway, and, and, and you can be generous in these areas in your life as well. The first question is, will you be generous with your prayers? Will you pray for the church every single day? I, I, I hope you're a person of prayer, even if you're not. Think about the church. Pray for Shiloh every day single day by your presence, online, in the pews, in the seats, if you can get here, whether unless you're sick or unless you're on vacation, be present as much as you can. Gifts. We're going to talk about that in just a second. Service. Will you serve the church? 
Will you find ways to, 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 to serve, whether it's on a committee or in a ministry or with the women of the church or with the men of the church or with the youth or with the children or in some way? Will you serve in the life of the church where we're glorifying God, where we're developing disciples and we're changing the world for Jesus? And will you be generous with your witness? Invite one person to come with you to church. Invite one person to tune into this broadcast. Br bring someone closer to God by sharing your faith with them. And yes, by your gifts. Quite frankly, friends, ministry costs money. Reaching people costs money. You want to have a pastor, it costs money. You want to have a staff, it costs money. You want to have a building, it costs money. So we need people who are willing to be generous so that we can do the amazing ministry we do around here at Shiloh. And we are blessed with a congregation that does that. And the more the congregation is generous, the more ministry we can do. Whether it's in Cambodia, or in inner city Cincinnati, or in Cuba, or in Delhi, or in any of our schools, or in, in Delhi Middle School, right across the street, right, right past that wall. That's what it takes to do ministry. So for those of you that are part of the church, thank you for your, your generosity. This is an invitation to some introspection, some work between you and God to see how you could be generous in the new year. For the rest of us, maybe it's something you want to consider because through our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness, we can glorify God, develop disciples of Jesus Christ, and change the world. God bless you. See you next week as we start the Advent season. Hey folks, when you come to church here in person, this is how you leave. This is how you go back out into the world. And at the end of our series where we're talking about the, the mission of the church, the purpose of the church, who we are and what we're supposed to be about, it's a great time to think about going out into the world where you're, you're watching this from. And out there is where we need to glorify God the most. Put Jesus at the center of our lives to, to worship in reverence and awe, even out there in the world. We need out there to develop disciples of Jesus. We need to learn more and more and more as much as we can about the kingdom of heaven and be willing to sacrifice on Jesus' behalf. And out there is where we change the world. We do that by being generous with our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. So go forth. And may that spirit of generosity lead you to that life of spirit so that you can have that list of nine in your life and you can be holy and fulfilled and find purpose and meaning for the living of this day. Go forth and may the love, the joy, the peace, the patience, the kindness, the gentleness, the self-control of our God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And may it be with you now and forever. Amen.